Anytime I get a message, I always like to back it up with scripture. So I tried to do my research before I came here tonight. Uh, I want to start out. Um, I don't get to really title a message, but uh, the title of this message is going to be Jesus, the True Mind. Um, I'm going to start out by sharing um, a story, two stories really that, that have occurred in my life within the past few weeks. The first one, uh, about two or three weeks ago, I was coming home. I was praying, and I, and I just said, God, how would you have the state of the church be in this day and hour? How do you want the church to be right now? What do you want us to be? And I got one, a one-word response, awake. And that really hit me. Um, because I expected a response of, well, I want you to go out and pray more. I want you to go out and evangelize more, this and that, and just awake. When we really start to think about what that means, when you're sleeping, you're alive. But you're kind of in suspended animation. You're not aware of what's going on. There could be dangers all around you, but you don't know. You're not being productive. You're not doing anything. You're essentially you're, you're just laying there stagnant. Um, and I felt like I was revealing to me that the state of the church today, not at, not everywhere, but in general, um, in the U.S., uh, is that we're sleeping. We've got our eyes closed to what God is doing. We're not listening to him. And he wants us to wake up because he's got a lot in store for us. And he wants to change hearts from the inside out. He wants to change families, change business structure from within. Um, it'll start in, in, at home, but it'll move on throughout the whole country, I believe. Um, another story that actually happened uh, yesterday. Uh, we went to Taco Bell it was on the lunch break. And uh, as we were leaving, um, I walked Kayla and Lily back to their car. But as we were leaving the, to the, the door over to the left, there was a guy standing there playing a harmonica and kind of singing real low. Um, well, I walked her back to her car and came back up, got into my car, turned the ignition, and I looked up and saw him playing his harmonica. And immediately, something pulled on my heart and said, share the love of Christ with this man. And I feel guilty because I immediately looked at the time to see how much time I had left before my lunch was over. And the reason I feel guilty is because it wasn't because I was ecstatic that I might have the chance to share the gospel with somebody. It was because I was afraid to talk to a complete stranger about Christ, not knowing how he would react. And I had hoped I didn't have enough time to get back you know, from lunch so that I wouldn't be late. But I pushed through that, I got back out of my car, and I said, you know, I, I don't know you, you don't know me, but I really feel like God wants me to tell you that Jesus loves you, and if there's anything I can pray for you about right now, just let me know. He said, he said, well, you can, you can pray, for, pray for my family, I've got four children, uh, please pray for them. Um, he said, uh, please pray for, he said my ancestors, but I'm assuming his father and mother, he was, um, he was an interesting stopped and prayed with him, and you could tell that it touched him. Um, and I asked him if I could hold his hand while I prayed for him, and he not only gave his hand, he got up close so I, mean, I could be right next to him. And he was so touched by a simple prayer and knowing that God loved him. And all I can think of is, what if I hadn't stopped to tell him that? He looked like he was a traveling um, artist or something like that. He sold little trinkets to try to get food money, things like that. Um, but what if, what if, what if I was the only Christian in the past five years that stopped and said, God loves you, and you should love yourself the way God loves you, and you should get into his kingdom. So that's, that's the premise of this whole message, essentially. Um, it's really getting out there. Um, so I'm going to bounce around. Uh, I've got a lot of scriptures. Um, We'll start uh, this first point. Jesus is the main vine. We Gentile Christians are grafted into that vine. As easily as we are grafted in, we can also be grafted out and cast into the lake of fire. We are a spiritual Israel. Israel. We now share in the promises of Abraham promised to Jesus, although we have no bloodline connecting us to him. Um, I've got a lot of scriptures to go along with this. The first one is in John 15, verses 1 through 17. 
This is Jesus speaking. I'll, just, I'll read from here. You, your translation might be a little bit different. Uh, Jesus said, I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do not bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. For a minute, remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my, with my joy. Yes, your joy will be overflowing. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if, I do what I, if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't combine it in slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. Essentially, and when he's talking about fruit, he's talking about the fruits of the Spirit. It's, it's talking about, this is just physical stuff. When we're supposed to be storing up treasure in heaven, we're storing up people. When we go out and make new converts and we, when we introduce them to the, love, to the love of Christ and bring them into the kingdom, they are our treasure. And God wants us to be fruitful and bring new people into the kingdom and really bless and heal people everywhere we go. Um, the next scripture was in Romans. I don't know if anybody's going to follow along. Um, Romans 4. Probably should have looked more things in here. Uh, Romans 4, verses 13 through 18. Clearly, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. If God's promise is only for those who obey the law, then faith is not necessary and the promise is pointless. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift, and we are all certain to receive it. Whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and created new things out of nothing. And as Christians, through faith, we become heirs to this promise. Um, in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 7. Bounce around a lot, but I feel like all of these go together. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 17. Again, this backs up what he was talking about, how we are essentially royalty by faith. We are taken into God's kingdom. This Melchizedek was king of the city of Salem and also a priest of God of his time. When Abraham was returning home after winning a great battle against the kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. Then Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. The name Melchizedek means king of justice, and king of Salem means king of peace. There is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors, no beginning or end to his life. He's speaking about Jesus here. He remains a priest forever, resembling the Son of God. Consider that how great this Melchizedek was. Even Abraham, the great patriarch of Israel, recognized this by giving him a tenth of what he had taken in battle. Now the law of Moses required that the priests, who are the descendants of Levi, must collect the tithe from the rest of the people of Israel, who were also descendants of Abraham. But Melchizedek, who was not a descendant of Levi, collected a tenth from Abraham. 
and Melchizedek placed a blessing upon Abraham, the one who had already received the promises of God. And without question, the person who has the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who is blessed. The priests who collect tithes are men who die, so Melchizedek is greater than they are, because we are told that he lives on. In addition, we might even say that these Levites, the ones who collect the tithe, paid a tithe to Melchizedek when their ancestor Abraham paid a tithe to him. For although Levi wasn't born yet, the seed from which he came was in Abraham's body when Melchizedek collected the tithe from him. So if the priest, priesthood of Levi, on which the law was based, could have achieved the perfection God intended, why did God need to establish a different priesthood, with the priest in the order of Melchizedek instead of the order of Levi and Aaron? And if the priesthood is changed, the law must also be changed to permit it. For the priest we are talking about belongs to a different tribe, whose members have never served at the altar as priests. What I mean is, our Lord came from the tribe of Judah, and Moses never mentioned priests coming from that tribe. This change has been made very clear, since a different priest, who is like Melchizedek, has appeared. Jesus became a priest, not by meeting the physical requirement of belonging to the tribe of Levi, but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. And the psalmist pointed this out when he prophesied, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. I believe that through faith, when we believe in Christ, and we're accepted in the promises made even to Abraham. Um, I mentioned a minute ago, we are royalty in Christ's kingdom. Christ mentioned the kingdom of God a lot. It's not just some obscure thing floating off in some other dimension that you go to when you die. It is, it is a real kingdom. And we are kings and queens and daughters of priests. And many Christians don't realize how much power they have in Christ when they invoke his name. Just a simple, in Jesus' name, be healed is all it takes sometimes for someone to get up that was in a wheelchair. And we're, we're given that right. Jesus himself said that these things in greater will you do. I'm going to go to uh, Romans real quick. Romans chapter 11. Verses 7 through 8. Uh, 7 through 8. Um, so this is the situation. Most of the people of Israel have not found the favor of God they are looking for so earnestly. At the time he was speaking of the Jews that had rejected Christ. Few have, the ones God has chosen, but the hearts of the rest were hardened. As the scriptures say, God has put them into a deep sleep. To this day, he has shut their eyes so they do not see and closed their ears so that they do not hear. And I really feel that God was speaking that even in this day and hour, we who profess to believe in Christ, let's truly believe in him and do what he's called us to do and act on what he's called us to do and not be those who were put to sleep and and they did not be able to hear or see. Um, Romans 11, 17 through 24. Um, to reiterate a little bit what we went over. But some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel, have been broken off. And you Gentiles who were branches from a wild olive tree have been grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. But you must not brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. You're just a branch, not the root. Well, you may say, those branches were broken off to make room for me. Yes, but remember, those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ, and you are there because you do not because you do believe. So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. Notice how God is both kind and severe. He's severe towards those who disobeyed, but kind to you if you continue to trust in his kindness. But if you stop trusting, you also will be cut off. And if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted in again. For God has the power to graft them back into the tree. You, by nature, were a branch cut from a wild olive tree. So if God was willing to do something contrary to, the na to nature by grafting you into his cultivated tree, he would be far more eager to graft the original branches back into the tree where they belong. A lot of people 
A lot of people sometimes forget that Jesus was a Jew. He was a Christian, but he was a Jew. And he came first to the lost people of Israel, and they rejected him. And this is another beauty of, of Gentile Christians, I believe we have, that a lot of people, they don't realize. If you know a Jewish friend who doesn't believe in Christ, it's our duty to introduce them to the love of Christ. And all throughout the whole New Testament, um, here, Paul quote Old Testament scriptures proving that Jesus was the Messiah. And I believe when we bring his promise, his holy people together, we have life. Um, in Galatians, Jesus said that what he had already done, all the miracles he had done, these things are greater for him to see. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. And what I think of when he said that, it's very powerful to me. Jesus walked on water. Lazarus was dead for multiple days. Raised him up, didn't stink. He cast demons out of children, raised other people from the dead. Look at all of the things that Jesus did. There's even at the end of one of uh, the books in the New, New Testament, the writer says, I don't think all the books of the world can contain all the miracles that Jesus did while he was alive. And yet here's Jesus, and he's, Jesus is God, he cannot lie. Here's Jesus saying we can do the same thing that he did before. And we have to believe that what Jesus said is true. Um, in Mark 16, um, 17 through 18, Verse 
verses 1 through 14. The, this is Ezekiel speaking. The Lord took hold of me, and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered across, everywhere across the ground, and were completely dried out. Then he asked me, Son of man, can these bones become living people again? Very wisely, Ezekiel replied. O sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. Then he said to me, Speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, Dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Look, I am going to put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke this message just as he told me. Suddenly as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves to complete skeletons. Then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones, and skin formed to cover their bodies, but they still had no breath in them. And he said to me, Speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath, from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies so they may live again. So I spoke the message as he commanded me, and breath came into their bodies. They all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying, We have become old, dry bones. All hope is gone. Our nation is finished. Therefore prophesy to them and say, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. O my people, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, O my people, you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live again, and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. This is something. This is a particular chapter in the Bible that God, I feel, has been laying on my heart for years now. And I feel like he's speaking about our church. This church, the church as a whole, that where we were sleeping, where we were dead, we were raising up new warriors, a new army to combat what the enemy is trying to do. And as many people will say that the U.S. is going to hell and the U.S. is this and it's that, and all the negatives, I believe it's, it's never too late. And I believe that God is raising up a fire in the hearts of many young and old prayer warriors and Christians. He's bringing together the hearts of the fathers to the hearts of the sons and the mothers to the daughters. He's bringing us together like family, like we should be, so that when it comes time to go out and preach the gospel to those who don't know, Jesus said, you'll know that you're a believer if you love one another as I love you. When we go out into the world and people see, wow, I want the, what they have. They have love. My whole life, I mean, uh, you know, I've gotten hooked on drugs, or I've been drinking a lot, hooked on pornography. I've, I've been abused. I feel worthless. When they see that Christians have what they need, love, tenderness, gentleness, and healing, that's what's going to attract people genuinely to the church. It's not going to be big events. It's not going to be musical shows, although that can help to get them there, that first step in the door. What's really going to change hearts and turn people around is the love of Christ. Um, you know, in, in Mark 16, uh, 17 through 18, it said that believers will, it said those who have faith will, and it's, it's not that they might do this, they will cast out demons, speak in tongues, be protected from deadly things. It mentioned serpents. It said if you can drink something that's poison, it's not going to hurt you. And lay hands on the sick and they will recover. God's not a liar. If he says that we are blessed in these many ways, then we are. If we're not walking in it, it could just be that we're not choosing to. I'm going to move on. Second um, Timothy chapter, thir uh, chapter 3. Uh, chapter 3, 
verses 1 through 5. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Um, find the other scriptures. I move to Revelation chapter 3. And I'll tie those two good things together. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. Uh, this was Jesus speaking. This is, this is a message to the seventh church, the final church that, um, that was seen in this vision. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire, then you will be rich. Also buy white garments for me, so you will be not, not be shamed by your nakedness, and ointment for your eyes, so you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in, and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. And I'm guilty of this. Um, I think here in America, we're so blessed we don't realize how blessed we are. Um, it's, it's very easy even for me to fall into this trap of, well, I've got a good job, I've got a good house, I've got a good car, I'm blessed, I've got all these things, and not realize or, or forget that the true blessings, the true oracles of God, the, the treasures of God, are bringing people into his kingdom. I can have all the things in the world, uh, and I'm very thankful and very blessed to have everything that I need month after month. But what's even more important is really sharing Christ's love with other people. And I'm very, I'm guilty myself of not going out and preaching to complete strangers. It's unnerving, it's stressful. You wonder what they're going to think, what they're going to say. But Jesus didn't, that didn't stop Jesus. And Jesus, when he was preaching, he went out where people could find him. He didn't go into a building unless it was a synagogue. He often was found walking through the streets where anyone who wanted to hear him could come and listen to him. And he said, nobody comes to, the, to me except the Father calls them. He went where people could see him, regardless of what people would think. And I'm sure many people, even in his day, called him crazy, called him a lunatic, but he wasn't. Um, and sometimes we've got to be willing to get out of our comfort zones. It stinks. It's scary. But I can, I can guarantee even the man that I prayed for yesterday, during that experience, even just praying with him, I could feel the love of God in me. And I could tell that he was feeling it too. And even after that, I think just the simple act of faith of stepping out and saying, I'm going to do what you just asked me to do, God, empowers you to do exactly what you just asked you to do. Because even after praying for him, as I went back to work, right, driving back to work, I was almost to the point of tears, thinking how many times he's asked me to do that very thing, and I was too scared to do it. When I was in high school, I felt led to stand up on the lunchroom tables and start preaching. And unfortunately, I didn't do that, and that was, that was a big miss. 
Because for all I know, I might have been that one person that helped a lot of people in that school come to know Christ. I might have had detention, but it would have been okay. <laughs> um, we're getting to, uh, to the close here. I've heard some people preach, once saved, always saved. I think there's a few scriptures that disagree with that. I think when you accept Christ, you accept not only that he died for you, but that you, you're going to give your life to him. And giving your life, your life to him doesn't mean, oh, I believe in Jesus, but I'm going to go do this on the weekend. Well, I believe in Jesus, but I'd rather do that instead of go pray for that person. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. I think uh, Paul makes it pretty simple. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge, and I feel like this is kind of the key here, because in other in other scriptures, Paul makes it very clear that if you sin, the grace of Jesus is there to cover you. I think he's talking about people, though, that make a lifestyle out of these sins. Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, or who worship idols, or who commit adultery, or are male prostitutes who practice homosexuality, or are thieves, or greedy people, or drunkards, or are abusive, or cheat people. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say, food was made for the stomach, and the stomach for food. This is true, so someday God will do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise us from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is a part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't, re don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her. But the scripture says the two are united into one. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. And in Galatians, this is going to be the last scripture. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16. Galatians chapter 5, 13 through 15. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Before the way of destroying one another. So in other words, in summation again, I feel like what God is doing right now, at least in the United States Church, the people that are here right now, he's building up a fire in our hearts. There's people here right now that I think know what I'm talking about. And there's people that are even in their homes, haven't said anything, but they're, they're starting to feel a yearning for God that they didn't have before, that they can't quite understand and can't quite explain. But it's God that calls us and not us that try to find him. I think he's calling up warriors. He's waking us up. He's equipping us. And I think very soon we're going to see a fire spread. Already we're seeing revival break out all over uh, the Appalachia region, and Kentucky and Virginia and West Virginia. And I think it's going to spread. Um, but what's most important is even in our day-to-day -day lives, you know, getting out, 
in front of a million people can be great. But maybe that one person that you've never talked to about Christ before can be just as important. And a lot of times, things can start a domino effect. that. I might talk to somebody that I work with who's an atheist and convince them, show them God is real and God loves them. And they might become, I don't like Paul was. Paul did a, a 180. He was persecuting the Christians. He was glad to have coats put at his feet while Christians were killed right in front of him. And Jesus showed up and showed him who he was. And he turned around and he ended up being one of the biggest conduits of Christ's love ever. There could be that one person that we minister today, today, tomorrow, who we die, that sends that wave on. And what's also very important is that we don't use the freedom that we have in Christ to satisfy ourselves. Faith in Christ grants us the blessing promised to Abraham. But we shouldn't use that we found freedom to do it. So all I'm asking is, and encouraging everybody to do is, is listen to God a little bit more. Because I know even in me, from day to day, there are times when I just feel like that still small voice says, who should you go talk to that person? Pray with that person. Do this act of kindness for that person. Because it might be the only person that day that makes a difference. I want to close with prayer real quick. <clears throat> Father, we just thank you tonight that we're able to come here freely into your presence. And it's not just in this building, Father, we could come before you any part of the day so that we could see what you're doing and follow along with it. Father, I ask <clears throat> for your spirit to fall. For a double portion of blessing on everyone that is in this building, Father, that they would take it home to their families, take it home, Father, you bless their homes, bless the marriages that are represented in this church, bless the job and the career, and give us, let us see new opportunities to minister to those who don't know you yet, Father. Father, help us to see how we take you for granted sometimes. Me, I, I gave my life to you when I was four years old, and I grew up with you my whole life, and I never quite understood what it meant to not have you in my life. And now when I look at it, though, I can see those who didn't grow up with you, those who don't know you, are missing out so much. Let us look at it like that. Let us not look at evangelizing like a chore, but let us look at it like a gift to give other people. Something that can uplift them, change their circumstances, and bring them into your kingdom, Father. We pray that your blessing will be on us as we go out and do just that. In Jesus' name.
my spirit that we, we, as right here, as ones that are sitting right here in this church tonight, God wanted us here. He's called us as warriors to go out and bring in who we can bring in, to witness and testify and talk and to be bold. And he knows that us that are sitting here, that are in this church tonight, will do that. And that's what he wants us to do, just what you said. He wants us to do, and there's an urgency about it. And he wants us to pray. We need to pray mightily for this country and for the air people here. Because I believe that God has given us our last chance. And I believe that. And I believe that we as group has to be bold and strong and we got to get out and show the true love of God and what God can do and talk and witness and talk and witness and talk and witness. I just feel it so strong all over me. We're here. You wouldn't believe what a time I had getting here this evening. I mean, I really, it was one thing right after another. I got so aggravated, I went into my bedroom and sit in my chair, and I just prayed to myself, you know, Lord, don't let me get all tore up over this. And I, I, he's got us here tonight for a reason, people. So we need to really be doing God's work. 